During the Great Depression, certain financiers and industrialists plot to overthrow President Franklin D. Roosevelt and install a dictator in his place. To conservatives in general, and certainly to business people in particular, Roosevelt appeared as a traitor to his class. Could a plot to create a fascist state in the U.S. have succeeded? Considering the time and the money behind it and the power of the men behind it, they would definitely have been successful. Join us as we go in search of history to uncover the plot to overthrow FDR. The seeds of the plot to overthrow FDR were sown in the veterans movement that began after World War I. Then, veterans got $60 mustering out pay and a train ticket back home, but felt they deserved more. After numerous compromises, the U.S. Congress finally passes legislation in 1924. World War I veterans receive a pension in the form of bonus certificates based on the time each man served. The certificates issued at the beginning of 1925 are redeemable with interest in 20 years when the average veteran will receive about $1,000. I think it was seen as a compromise. I think they were delighted the fact to have a bonus passed. Uh, they were obviously a lot less happy about having to wait 20 years to actually see the money. But by the spring of 1930, the U.S. economy is rocked by dramatic bank failures, shut down businesses, and foreclosed farms. The Great Depression begins. From late October 29 until March of 1933, the economy just went downhill. This created a kind of infectious pessimism. And of course, as more and more people feel that way, it just reinforces this, this attitude of, of doom and gloom. Nervous veterans groups, encouraged by populist politicians such as Congressman Wright Patman of Texas, demand that the bonus certificates be paid in full immediately. We're asking for the payment of a just and honest debt. It will be a godsend to this nation because the nation needs the additional purchasing power which this bill will afford. Government estimates put the bonus cost at roughly $2.2 billion, more than half of the 1932 federal budget. Opponents argue this is too expensive. There was a prevailing opinion that veterans shouldn't get any special benefits, that benefits should be extended over the vast population. Now, that obviously would have aroused considerable resentment and anger among veterans across the country. In 1932, roughly 20,000 veterans calling themselves the Bonus Army descend upon Washington to show support for the Patman Bonus Bill. They camp out in tents and hastily erected shacks. Some of the veterans take over condemned buildings. The police evict them by force. The veterans dig in, vowing to stay until they get the bonus. Then, on July 28, 1932, Army Chief of Staff General Douglas MacArthur defies President Hoover's orders and leads a regular Army force to drive the veterans from their encampments. In the ensuing melee, several veterans are killed and many, accompanied by their wives and children, are gassed and beaten. I think be fairly said that events got at hand at the time I think they were hoping to be able to remove people fairly peaceably with a show of force it didn't turn out that way it was not a, a good day in American history Herbert Hoover his reputation already tarnished by his inability to deal effectively with the country's economic woes is blamed for the incident Herbert Hoover's presidency was at a standstill. Nobody knew what was going to happen. It was a very depressing period. Nobody thought there was a future. Veterans are not the only group disillusioned with the government. Wealthy Americans are also living in fear of losing what they have. These were people 
who had acquired great wealth and power they knew that the world was fundamentally changing they didn't know how it was changing but certainly the same kind of people had backed Hitler and Germany and Mussolini and Italy Benito Mussolini rose to power in 1925 with the help of corporate interests his private militia known as the black shirts was comprised in large part by Italian World War I veterans. His fascist regime restored Italy's industrial viability. In the 1920s, uh, Mussolini in the United States was very popular, not just among Italian Americans, but among some reformers who thought of Mussolini as a kind of Italian Theodore Roosevelt, brought efficiency and vim and vigor to Italy. And there was curious interest in maybe bringing some features of Mussolini's regime, like the corporate state structure, to the United States. There are those who believe that this fascist model is the key to U.S. economic recovery. And in 1932, the mass of disgruntled veterans could be the instrument to make this change. Most of the countries of Europe in the 1930s were being led by dictators or quasi-dictators. And veterans groups had, in almost every instance, installed those people in power. Against this backdrop, the nation's attention is focused on the 1932 presidential election. New York Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt promises Americans a new deal. This is more than a political campaign. It is a call to arms. Franklin Roosevelt wins the presidency with an activist agenda to transform the very structure of American economic life. When Franklin Roosevelt came to office, he very quickly announced his intention to engage, as he called it, in bold, persistent experimentation to bring the economic crisis to an end. <laughs> Those words in and of themselves probably ruffled feathers. During the first hundred days of his administration, Roosevelt signs into law a dizzying array of programs designed to stimulate the languishing economy. Yet of all the unprecedented innovations brought by FDR, it is his decision to take the nation off the gold standard that most infuriates the Wall Street elite. I think probably there was a certain very childish element in some of these capitalists of that period of time. They just knew that man was in the White House and he didn't seem to know what he was doing. And there were people like Mussolini and others who did seem to know what they were doing and would surround himself with the right kind of people. Them! According to sworn testimony before a congressional committee, it is sometime during the uneasy summer of 1933 that some of the wealthiest financiers and industrialists in the U.S. began to discuss the possibility of replacing the president with a dictator. They envision a paramilitary force of unemployed and disgruntled veterans as the source of their power. In order to put the plan into action, the plotters need to enlist a charismatic leader, a man on a white horse, to whom the veterans will pledge their loyalty and follow without question. They choose a very controversial soldier. 